This retro tea break is supported by Fusion Gaming Magazine, a brand new magazine covering all types of gaming. It includes insights from industry veterans and articles from familiar names, like this guy. Oh, that looks good. The magazine fuses retro with modern, indie, and even tabletop gaming, perfect for your own retro tea break and impressing the kids with your up-to-date gaming knowledge. Visit fusionretrobooks.com to subscribe or click the link in the video description. Lemmings and Grand Theft Auto, two iconic games which have benefited in no small part thanks to the talents of today's guest. He was part of the team at DMA Design who helped to put the Amiga on the map as a quality games machine with titles such as Blood Money before putting us in the map of the open world of Liberty City in GTA, one of the most successful video game franchises of all time. Please welcome Mike Daly. Welcome, Mike. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for spending some time with us today, Mike. Um, just out of interest, what have we interrupted you from today for your tea break? Um, I'm just doing some contract work at the moment. so. Okay, on a need-to-know basis then. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, where did video game development begin for you? Uh, let's see, probably back in the 80s um, when the home computer kind of first appeared. Um, I was about 13 at the time. And a friend of mine got hold of a ZX81 that these uh, folks had bought. And I used to go down to his house and we used to play around on it. Um, and then he upgraded to a Spectrum and I managed to persuade my mother to buy his ZX81. Um, and that was the kind of start of my journey of just me fiddling constantly with it. Yeah, your mother, who appears many times on your blog, uh, I can feel her angst at some of your decision making through the years as you get into the <laughs> video games industry, a less traditional industry than perhaps she wanted you to be a part of. But, yeah, uh, it came good in the end. Um, <laughs> and of course, the Kingsway Amateur Computer Club plays a part in that story, doesn't it? Where you met some yeah. of the other DMA members. Yeah. Were you a regular at that club, or was that a sort of one-off that you went to? Um, no, I mean, so. I I keep trying to pin down exactly when it was I went there. Um, I think I was about 15 at the time. Um, a chap at school called Colin Beasley, who was in the year below me, had mentioned that I should probably go along to this club. Um, I knew nothing about it. And so he just told me to take the computer, your TV with you. So I had this huge hold all that I took, um, my little black 14 inch black and white portable in and my Comda plus four which is the machine i had at the time um and traped along to this uh this club that was just slightly terrifying to go to knowing nothing about it because I'm, I'm a bit of an introvert so it's going to these things is always a bit of a leap in the dark um and it was fine i mean there was a, a good few folk there but most of them were kind of typical gamers at the time where they they were really just kind of there to swap games and copy them and, and whatnot. But there was a couple of folk there that um, were a lot more interested in making games. So Steve Hammond I met there, uh, Dave Jones and Russell Kay, they were there as well. I think the first time I was there, uh, Dave had his Amiga. He just bought an Amiga. Um, and I'm sure that was... One of the times he brought that along, um, and because there was little crowds gathered round um, as he showed off, like Defender of the Crown and stuff, which we, you know, I'm sitting on the plus four and he's the Defender of the Crown running. He kind of <laughs> gobsmacked to that. It's just so that just would have been gorgeous. a, a one thousand, would it back then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was. He imported it from America. I think it wasn't actually out here yet. So it was an American money he managed to get hold of uh, from his redundancy money from Timex. So, um, but I mean, we all kind of congregated. Um, I took along, like I say, my plus four, and I showed some of the, the work I'd been doing. Um, I say work, fiddling about. I had a, a kind of scrolling spaceship like you would get in uh, Uridium um, on the plus four with kind of raster splitting stuff. Um, and I ended up talking probably more to Steve Hammond at the time. Um, Russell and Dave were a wee bit older, um, and they were already kind of um, paired together. They were doing a, a ZX Spectrum game uh, called Zone Trooper. Um, so they were still kind of working together. So I kind of gravitated towards Steve more. And then, yeah, was that also as, in part because perhaps you needed a, a talented artist to contribute to your game? 
with Steve well, being the, the artist. It, it was Steve was still kind of programming stuff, so okay. um, didn't really know that he did much art at the time. Um, so it was really just that interest of making things that kind of drew us all together. Um, and then as soon as you start sewing this kind of stuff, like say, uh, Russell and, and Dave would kind of come over and look as well, because there wasn't really much of that going on. So it was kind of something new. Um, and then from then on, we'd kind of go back there um, and same kind of thing, just show what we'd been doing for the week and so on. Um, and then after that, we, we kind of pair up to do different games ourselves. So I would do a game with Steve um, and then we'd do a game with, I'd do a game with Russell, I'd do a game with Dave and so on. And we'd all just kind of do that. None of them really got finished. I think Freak Out was the only one that I actually finished. That was the one with Steve. Um, but the rest of them were all just kind of learning things. Um, during that time, I upgraded from a plus four to a 64. Uh, one of my other friends was getting rid of their 64, so I managed to get that cheap as well. And I started learning that. So that's that's when we really started doing lots of games with Russell and Dave as well. So it was it was a fun period just learning. Yeah, so even with your next upgrade to the 64, then the Amiga 1000 was just still untouchable oh, yeah, price-wise. Yeah. And yeah. 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 Like, so. Well, DMA's first commercial release, correct me if I'm wrong, had the working title CopperCon 1 and would be released as Menace. I think it even had another title before yeah, release. Yeah, that was Draconia. Um, right. So it was CopperCon 1 was the internal one that we kind of used until they actually got a proper title. And it was Draconia for a long time. And even some magazine reviews were reviewing it as Draconia. Um, and then I think there was another game called that, so it got changed very late in the day, just before it came out, to Menace. Mm -hmm. And what was your part, what was your contribution to Menace? Um, I didn't do anything on Menace, really. Um, that was kind of Dave um, and Steve did a bit of the graphics until he got, Dave paired up with an artist uh, called Tony Smith who he met through his Kent team, his hacking group. Um, and Tony's stuff was amazing. So, But until that, Steve was doing little graphics, little ships and stuff. Um, and then Tony came along, did all the artwork for it. So we were kind of peripheral at that point. Um, like I say, we were all just kind of making our own little things. Dave was just the, the first person to actually finish one and then go and get it published. Yeah, so, so the evolution um, of DMA into the company that we would come to know, it, it kind of happened over a period of years quite yeah. naturally. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So how did you eventually find yourself as an official employee of DMA? Um, so let's see, David just finished Menace um, and he was well on the way doing Blood Money. Um, I had finished school and gone to college very briefly for about three months, uh, at which point I got kicked out because it was never there. Um, I was doing a, effectively a sysadmin course. That was the only thing really that you could get in with that had programming in it, but the course was awful. Um, and it was a college course, so I got politely asked to leave. So I was at home um, for a few months doing nothing, um, at which point my, my mother started sending me out for interviews to places like B&Q, Texas Home Care, and all that kind of stuff to try and get a job. Um, in between that, I would go down to Dave's as he was writing Blood Money. Um, and I'd done a routine for um, sprites to do all these kind of curvy paths and stuff. Um, in Menace, Dave had basically done all these with individual move to points where it would kind of move around. You know, you'd have every single one was a little move command. Um, whereas the new one I had, a single command could make it do massively complicated functions. So... I sat and read that out, and he sat. He typed it in and converted it to sixty-eight thousand for the uh, the Amiga on Blood Money, um, and then about was it three or four months after Christmas, so it would have been April, May kind of time. Um, Dave decided that he was going to get an office. He was going to do, he, he was chucking in his uh, his college things. That sort of we'll just kind of go for it, um, and then asked me if I wanted a job. That was my first interview. Fancy a job? Yes, please. That was about it, really. Uh, we were just downtown at the time, um, walking through town. We went, yeah, okay, that, that, that'd be good. Oh, so, yeah, interviews don't come much better than no, that. No, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> so that was that was my introduction to to getting into DMA. Um, so that would have been about May or so time. He managed to get a contract from Psygnosis at that point. Um, actually, no, before that, he got me a 
um, a Dolphin DOS from a Commodore 64. Um, I was doing a little shoot 'em up game, and he got me this to help me actually progress with it because um, just doing it on the 64 was kind of limited. So I had to swap to disk assembly rather than all in memory. So using that, I was able to kind of produce a bigger demo, um, although it still took 20 minutes to assemble the thing every time, which was just painful. Um, and then he used this demo to show Psygnosis that I could program, and he got the contract for doing ballistics on the Commodore 64, which was uh, an ST Amiga game by Reflections. Um, and that was a bit terrifying. He brought in, uh, with the computer club had moved at that point down to what is now Aberty University. It was Bell Street Tech at that point. Um, and he brought basically this little set of equations for doing sphere-to-sphere -sphere collisions that ballistics used. And it's about 16 multiplies and various adds for every collision. Um, and on a Commodore 64 with no power multiply or anything, that was slightly terrifying. So um, that was my first kind of challenge. Um, and then Russell got the job of porting Menace from the Amiga to PC. So I ended up going down to his house while Dave sorted out an office. Um, and for about three months or so, Russell and I were in his bedroom um, writing game stuff, basically. Um, and Steve Hammond would appear occasionally. So we're in a kind of slightly odd, a very small room. Um, Russell was on a desk. Um, I think I had a bit of space there as well, but I also had, there was a, a plank shoved in a, a chest of drawers um, so we could balance another computer on that, so we could all kind of squeeze in. Um, it was very odd. Taking British but... bedroom Cody to the extreme, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> it really was, yeah. So, I mean, it, it was bizarre, but it was great. So about three or months or so of that, we, we, we kind of plodded on with that, made some progress, and then they finally opened the office at... Um, 134B Meadowside in Dundee, the little red building, um, and we opened in August, um, uh, 30 years ago. So 30 years this month uh, we opened, which was um, great, just having a proper place to go. 30 real years develop. of DMA in an yeah. office. Do you have any plans to celebrate that, that uh, anniversary? Um, I think we're going to, as a, as a kind of DMA crowd, I think we're going to see if we can just get together and... and have a pub crawl or something that's probably about it. Um, but we're kind of scattered all over the place now so um, it'll take a, a few months to organize i think but yeah i mean it's it's a nice milestone yeah um, it'd be a shame not to be a shame not yeah to. well um menace certainly put dma design on the bat on the map it received its highest rating in st and amiga format with 90 percent other magazines rated it high to mid 70s if you were a games journalist at the time what would you have rated it at we're talking the Amiga and ST versions. Yeah, Amiga one would have been 80 or so percent. ST one, I mean, for the machine, probably about the same again. Uh, Brian Watson did the, um, who was a pal of Dave's, he did the ST port. Um, the ST's not particularly good at scrolling, so he, he had to jump through some hoops for that. Um, but it still plays quite well. The Amiga one's good fun. And for its time, it was pretty good. So, yeah, 80, 85%, I would have said. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, it reportedly sold 20,000 copies. So the money was obviously flowing in to afford things like that office and uh, more opportunities, which you've spoken about. Um, one of those opportunities, I believe, was the chance for you to work on a Shadow of the Beast port, which uh, sounded quite frustrating for you. Yeah. So after Ballistics, I got to do a port of Blood Money to the 64, which was great doing a proper shoot 'em up on a C64, that was brilliant fun. Um, but these games tended to take about six months each, which was fine. After that, I actually played briefly with doing, Dave was starting another game called Gore, which was a big hack and slash. So the idea was to have huge characters. Um, and I started playing with getting that in the 64, doing multiplex sprites and stuff, just to try and see if a 64 could do it. Um, in between that, I did a little test of a, a lemming walking around but then Dave got this contract to do Shadow of the Beast on the PC Engine um, because the PC Engine was 6502 um, and that was my kind of language then I was given that although Dave was desperately keen to do it himself because he was a big PC Engine fan um, but 
he was a 60,000 boy, so um, I was given the PC Engine to do. So the machine itself, PC Engine was an amazing machine, um, ballistically quick. I'd come from a, a 1 megahertz 6502 and then gone to this 7 megahertz uh, 65CO2. 65 so I had more instructions and seven times the speed. I mean, if you can imagine these days going onto a PC that was seven times faster, it's ballistically quick. So the actual machine was great fun. Um, the game, however, wasn't. Um, it took way too long. It changed massively over the course of um, its evolution. We, we started out doing just a straight port. Uh, Steve was doing a lot of the graphics for it. Um, and we were taking some of the Amiga stuff over. Um, and NEC, who had who was doing the contract diagnosis, um, they kind of came up and went through and they just didn't want it to, to be the same as the Amiga at all. They wanted it to be enhanced and so on. So it ended up moving from just a straight PC Engine cartridge to their new CD-ROM system. Um, and that was incredibly complicated. Um, the CD-ROM system didn't have anything like directory structures or anything like that. It just had a big disk and you had like direct indexes to files and stuff. It was a nightmare. Um, it did, however, have the biggest hard drive we'd ever seen at the time. Back then, we'd be dealing with oh, 20 or 40 megabyte hard drives, I think was the biggest we got. And we got shipped this huge 720 meg uh, SCSI hard drive. I mean, it was you know massively thick. It was like two drives thick kind of thing. So the whole office was kind of gathered around to see it because it was just insane. But still, presumably, that would hold the development tools and then the capacity of one single CD-ROM. I know it was space. just that was just for the CD. Just for the CD, wow. Yeah. So the, all the dev tools were still on the normal PC. This was a separate disk that sat in the machine to emulate the actual hard drive or either CD ROM stuff. Um, and it was just insane. Um, but the main problem with it, I mean, I, I kind of drag my heels with it. One of my biggest problems doing games is making levels of stuff because I'm, aside from Lemmings, which I did lots of levels for, doing these kind of paths and things in games i hate with a passion um so i kind of struggled to kind of get the levels through and in um i ended up going on holiday someplace for a week or so and dave put steve on it and steve rattled through it really quickly and got most of them done so he kind of saved the day right uh, so your sure. preference is more of a, an engine builder and then yeah. let's see what people come up with using your yeah. engine yeah um which is much much more interesting yeah um so yeah but I mean, it, I think it ended up taking about two years to do that game, which in the time when we were doing games in six months, that was a long time. Mm. We ended up doing full FMV sequences and everything for it. So it was a complicated thing. Mm. Well, you mentioned uh, another demo before we came on to that, which was the, the little walking lemming. Yeah. Um, now, I understand it had something to do with the game Walker. Is that where the seed of the, the idea or the animation yeah. came from? Yeah. So... When Dave was doing Blood Money, he had this um, Walker character from Star Wars, the two-legged attack, um, and he really liked it. Tony Smith had done a really cool job of, of making this sprite, so Dave wanted to do a game with it. So he hired a guy called Scott Johnson to come in and basically make some graphics for it. And Scott started out by making a sprite of 16 by 16 pixels um, for the Walker to shoot, but that would have brought the character up to just below the cockpit, so you kind of lost all the scale of it. Um, so Scott and I had a little argument where I told him he was wrong and decided to whip out deep in and, and try and prove my point. So I made this animation, this sort of cycling animation of um, little guys kind of walking along the landscape and getting shot just to show that you can have them much smaller and still have that kind of character to them. Um, and then I showed that to the guys and they were all falling about laughing at this, all these different deaths that were going on. Um, and that kind of spawned it. Yeah, and this animation and a lot more besides is on Mike's blog, which I'll include a link to in the description so you can go and see. I think it's just it's an animated GIF now on your blog, so you can just go to the yeah. page and you can see the mouth munching up lemmings and the hands clapping and squashing them. Um, they're a different colour, but they're instantly recognisable. Yeah, I that. mean, some of the animations, once I'd showed them the initial set of animations, then Gary Timmons came along and smoothed out the animation. And he also did the thing like, you know, the... The, the munching mouth and the hands, he added those ones. I'd had the 10 ton weight and the shooting and stuff. So he, he added to that. Yeah. And then the concept for Lemmings was presented uh, at a meeting to Psygnosis 
did you attend that meeting? Can you remember anything about that? No. Um, so shortly after me doing that demo, the little animation, Russell managed to do uh, just a single screen demo of all the lemmings walking about. So he did a single screen and 100 lemmings on screen just following the terrain. And that was then shown to Psygnosis um, down at the PCW show uh, in London. Um, I, I wasn't in the meeting. I remember them all coming out and it was on the screen, but that was about it. Um, at the time, I believe they weren't particularly impressed with it. So, um, yeah, it, it changed over time, obviously. Well, Lemmings, it really needs no introduction to the listeners. It was a huge hit, selling over 55,000 copies on the first day alone on the Amiga and a lot more on the many ports that it received. Just what was it like being at the heart of a video game release that was so successful? What was the impact? I mean, when you're making a game, you have no idea how it's going to do. Um, You're just enjoying making the game, basically. But you you have no idea how it's going to be, how people are going to perceive it. Um, because all the games we work on, we think are really good and folk will enjoy them. But the way Lemmings took off caught us all by surprise. Um, I actually found an old magazine. It was, it was at my mother's and I don't even see you there. Yeah, I don't it's remember actually, that one. It's, it's an issue one that somebody pointed out to me. Um, and it's actually got, and I was wondered why she had it, but it's actually got, I'll just hold it. I'm going to scan it and put it up, but you'll see. It's actually got a preview of Lemmings, which is the only one I've ever seen. So, which is obviously why she had this magazine and had this preview in it. Um, and they were already raving about it. So, this was November. This kind of came out. So, obviously, at this point, we were, we were starting to get an inkling that some folk were interested in it. Um, but when it came out and how it took off and the resultant press was just incredible. I mean, getting 100% reviews from some games magazines was unheard of. It was incredible. So, yeah, I mean, we were just strutting about, thinking we were cool, as, as you would. You know, it's just, it was amazing. Strutting around Dundee like you owned the place, yeah. <laughs> well, the office, it's not quite Dundee, but the office. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Lemmings was, um, you know, it was a, a new kind of genre. It got people excited with a new type of gameplay. But I think a lot of the games back then, the new genres and the new games were, were driven by technical, um, almost technical demos, just by experimenting. Yeah. I mean, was there um, a feeling of experimentation when you were coming up with these games or did you s- stick to like a strict plan? This is the kind of game we're going to make and we're going <laughs> to stick to it. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, most games, particularly back in those days, don't really have um, these kind of plans. That, that back in the day, they were always technology driven um when let's see when dave did blood money he had a nice way of drawing sprites and doing the scroll and then a shoot 'em up came from that um when shadow of the beast on the amiga came out that was a tech demo showing all these layers of parallax came on that lemmings was the same it was having all these sprites on the screen um and kind of pushing the machine to do that and that's what kind of drove the game it's like, okay, now what can you do to, to actually use this technology in a game? Um, even going forward to GTA, GTA was, again, it's based on a tech demo. So, you know, all these kind of games kind of come from some kind of tech demo that looks cool. Um, it's only really once PCs and hardware got fast enough that you didn't really matter so much about that, where folks start, started sitting down and designing a game and then worrying about the technology later. Um But even now, you'll still get games based on tech demos. Yeah, yeah. So Lemmings truly was born out of just how many humans, little humans, can we make move on the screen at the same time? And then, oh, we we need to make a game out of this. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. brilliant. Um, Lemmings spawned a huge number of sequels. Did you get Lemming fatigue (laughs) or were there plenty of other projects that you then got involved in instead? Um, Yeah, I mean, I I did Lemmings 2 on the SNES. So... Um, I actually got to code some lemming stuff, and that was good fun. Um, I was on that again for quite a while because they had lots of Psygnosis were doing cartridge based games, and it took them a lot of time to to get things organised. So it took a while for that to kind of finish off. Um, I also did or helped out on Uni Racers um, on the SNES. Um, 
talking about other games. I mean, there's a few yeah, other games. Uni Racers is, is a story in its own right, isn't it? So after oh, yeah, Sony yeah. acquired Psygnosis, um, you, you flirted with the Super Nintendo making Uni Racers, and I didn't know that you'd done the, the Lemmings port there, so that as well. Um, and then Pixar claimed ownership to pretty much anything with a unicycle on it. Yeah. So, I mean, so, <laughs> Sony didn't buy Psygnosis till a wee bit later. Uh, it was about 94, 95 they bought Sony. No, if actually, it was later. It was after 95. So, yeah, because the PlayStation One came out, and we had games like Destruction Derby, which was still Psygnosis branded, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, up until that point, we were doing Universe with Nintendo, um, and that would have been ninety three, ninety four, I think. Um, and yeah, I mean, it came out, came out, and it got good reviews, and then Pixar took objection to it because it had a, a unicycle without a character on it. And they were claiming, oh, well, that's, that's ours. And, it's like that. Um, and the judge agreed, and that annoyed me, because how could you? Yeah, but hey, there you go. So the, the deal ended up being that they got, I think it was they got like an N64 dev kit or something, and we didn't make any more cartridges. So there was an initial run of 300,000, and that was it, which was a shame. Yeah, so it's quite a rare SNES title. Well, we'll move on to happier times then. <laughs> um, Grand Theft Auto, the big one. How how did that come into being then? Uh, so after Uni Racers, um, I got to go and just do R and D, play about, do my own thing. Um, so I was sitting playing with some tech ideas, um, and then we had a Sega Saturn in the office, and I saw Clockwork Night running. And I had this kind of nice parallax side-scrolling platform game, and I quite liked how the platforms worked. Um, I thought, well, I can maybe do that on the PC. So I did this kind of, you know, parallax um, scrolling background uh, platform system, um, and I showed some of the guys in the office. What were they working? At? Were they doing body harvest at the time? I think they were working, starting to work on the N64 stuff. Um, it wasn't public at that point, but they were starting to get all the tools ready. And they'd said that they'd been trying to get um, a driving game past Dave for ages, but Dave just wasn't interested. So something like that, Super Sprint or Micro Machines or something like that. So I kind of realized that if I put a kind of ground or a wall behind this parallax background that painted roads on it, it would go from a side-on thing to a top-down. Um, and then I put loads of these blocks in and made this kind of building city scape out of it um it was actually the second generation of it because the first one i had a rotating isometric that's what gta started out as so if you remember syndicate wars um it started out i had this rotating city and then we gave it to a team to work on and then syndicate wars came out and we suddenly realized it didn't work it just wasn't very good but i'd taken that tech that made all these blocks and then put this top-down city thing in it um, and I put the floor in it that was a um, the ground to drive on and all of a sudden yeah it was this kind of top-down city and then I showed Dave and he kind of likes I mean Dave likes the idea of basically giving people the sandbox to figure out Lemmings was very much that um, you don't really think of it like that but you put in this world and some tools are given to you and you've got to figure out how to get out um, nobody tells you or, or there's no fixed path. You can do it however you want. So Dave's kind of fascinated with that. So being able to have this living city um, was a big draw for him. And so he he got some of the guys around to have a, a look. So Keith Hamilton, who was doing the isometric version at the time, um, and Oz, who's, who's an artist, um, and we kind of discussed basically this engine and what they could do with it. Um, so they, they put the, they scrapped the isometric one and Keith took on the um, this new engine and started working with that with the view of having this living city and then trying to figure out a game how to put it into it as well. So same thing as before. You give them the, the tech and then they'll say, okay, what game can we put in it now? Um, so it started out as this race and chase thing. But Dave's idea being you could be either cops or robbers um, and then you could chase around and stuff. But it was too boring being the police, so everybody just wanted to steal things. Um, 
and yeah, like I say, history was born in that really. Yeah, no, it's interesting now you explain the, the parallax platformer because I can now see the way GTA moves. I can just imagine if you squint, that being a platformer yeah, running. Yeah, it's the, very much like, yeah. Moves. Um, when I first saw GTA, I remember um, the first thing it reminded me was was an old arcade game that I used to play in a taxi rank called Speed Rumbler. I don't know if you've ever played that game. Um, were there any existing games out there which you took inspiration from? when creating gta or was it just purely a tech demo no it was just a straight tech demo i was trying to make some tech work um that's kind of what i did at the time was just have ideas for different kinds of tech and play with it so when i was doing the rotating isometric stuff um it was a case of i was making an isometric renderer and then thought well everybody's done isometric so what can you do to make it different let's see if we can make it spin um, and then I did a little texture map thing for the top of it, which I'd never done before. And then from that, like I say, I had this thing that was basically a cube world that I was spinning. And it's like, well, let's do a cube world from top down using this other tech of um, the side on stuff. And then the texture mapper that I had for the top of the roofs, that became what we used for the cars. Um, and it was all just kind of tech driven to to see if we can make some kind of engine out of something mm -hmm. so yeah and even though it was tech driven and it was a 3d game it even came with 3d fx support uh, i think it did or it might have have to been patched in later I can't so remember. The, the 3d fx one was it was interesting because we um we got a couple of 3d fx cards for free from from them um and we had it for a long time a good year or two and then they came up to visit um, and we suddenly realized we hadn't done anything with it. So there was a kind of panic going, what can we do to show it? Uh, and it was either, either trying not together a demo of something. Um, and then because I'd taken over all the rendering stuff of GTA, I had this little library that I gave the team. Excuse me. And I thought, well, I could rewrite this library and, and use the 3D effects to, to draw everything. And then you could get it in high res and all that kind of stuff. So it only took me about a week to basically take the the engine that I had, convert it to 3D effects and get it all running. Um, so we ended up with this really cool high res filtered um, engine. And it ended up being so good that we thought, well, we've got to ship this. We can't just you know, throw it away um, as a work in progress thing. And it was interesting. I did meet, I can't remember who it was now. I did meet one of the guys from 3D effects who came up um, not so long ago. And he says, Seeing that, they suddenly realized you could use triangles and 3D stuff for doing 2D. It never occurred to them. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and it's interesting that you mention the, the 2D look, even though it was a 3D engine, the yeah. 2D look of it, because, um, you know, that was a more traditional look. So if you looked in a, a screenshot where it wasn't moving, you could have thought, this is a 2D game. Perhaps this yeah. looks a little bit old fashioned. Were mm. there any concerns initially from that compared to games like Tomb Raider that were coming out at the time? that approach uh, or not really you, you couldn't have done gta in 3d in those at that time um the number of characters walking about and the, the how complicated the city was you you kind of fog distance would have been like you know a few blocks in front of you there's just the the power just wasn't there to do that even with quake that was out at that point you know they only had a couple of things moving on screen at once so you think of gta with all the cars moving around all the different pedestrians and and how busy the city was, it was impossible to do it in 3D at that point. Even when it went on the PS2 much later into 3D, the draw distance wasn't very far, and there wasn't that much moving around. So, you know, you move five or six years earlier, you have no chance. So GTA was, to get GTA, it had to be that kind of viewpoint. Yeah, yeah, and just let the gameplay shine through, yeah. and it, it certainly yeah. did. It's all about the game. Were there any ideas, mechanics, weapons, or, or vehicles that didn't make it into that original GTA one that you wish had? I don't know. GTA was a funny one because it, it was very much a team-driven game. Um, most games are kind of, particularly these days, you've got one guy going, here's the design document, you're going to do this, this, and this. Uh, with GTA, it's one of the few games that was a kind of design by committee that actually worked, but it took long enough. You know, It took a long time to work. Um, but there was lots of, you know, this would be cool if we, we added in this feature or this feature. Um, and they, they put, uh, you know, stealing the cars, um, being able to steal a train or, um, you know, ambulances coming to pick people up. These were all just ideas from the team going, why knock that guy over? Wouldn't it be cool if an ambulance came and 
all these things just kind of made their way in. Um, I suspect we could have just kept going on and on um, with adding stuff, but it was just that kind of cut-off point. I can't think of anything major that was actually left out. Um, all the kind of cool, fun stuff was was in. Yeah, so you were pretty satisfied then when it came out. Yeah. You had everything in that you wanted. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, GTA would sell over a million copies. It wasn't quite as successful as Lemmings in that first version when you take mm-hmm. into account all the ports, but it's a legacy of subsequent um, sequels mm-hmm. and releases would they must run into the hundreds of millions um it's an absolutely oh, huge goodness. huge yeah. franchise are you or were you involved in any of those sequels what what happened next for you um gta 2 i was involved in i did the graphics engine for that um we actually did a software version and uh hardware 3d was kind of pretty mature at that point so we did a kind of um d3d version as well um, I left before GTA 2 was finished, so the software version got dropped, which was a shame because it was a really nice software render and all nice fractional um, pixel movement and stuff like Quake had. It was really pretty, but they kind of dropped it because the uh, level designers couldn't quite clean out the levels enough, so there was lots of hidden polys and stuff in there that just slowed the whole thing down. So every time they complained when I was there, I'd go and clean the level up and go, look, it works fine. All oh, right, okay, fine, that's fine. So when I left, and they didn't know how to clean it up, so uh, they've ended up just dropping the software one. And the the only addition I think was the the PlayStation version was getting done at the same time and as GTA Two, which was important because uh, was it? Um, I can't remember who was doing it. Uh, he added lights to it. Because before it was just the same as the original, uh, but it was just all in hardware. And then all of a sudden, um, the PlayStation 1 had a couple of lights in it. And I suddenly thought, oh, yeah, lights, that, that'd be quite cool. So I did a um, system of just being able to put lights everywhere in the, in the game. Um, and the team ended up, I think it only took me a weekend, and the team ended up using it to do traffic lights and explosions and all that kind of stuff. So the whole look kind of got that kind of way, you know, darker um, with all the cool explosions and stuff. Um, that was down to the PlayStation one. Well, um, Mike, I think we've had some really interesting insights from you. Thank you. I'd, I'd love to go into a lot more detail and um, hopefully we can get you booked in for our longer format podcast, which is Retro Island Diskettes, and we can take a deeper dive into some of those stories, find out a bit more sure. and find out what happened next and what you're doing now. Um, so until then, Thank you very much for uh, helping us to see all of those lemmings pop and uh, those pedestrians run for their lives in GTA. And uh, thank you very much. Take care, Mike. Bye-bye. If you enjoy my content and would like to toss a coin into the hat to support the cave, then check out patreon.com forward slash retro man cave and join the official cave dwellers you can see on the screen now. Thank you for your support.